This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. There have been some wild stories in the media in the last week or so due to another book that Francis has released. He did this interview book with some Italian journalists, and it's been published, or it was published in early April. It's called El Successor. Um, and uh, if you thought that his other book, the, the one on his life, was going to be spicy, this one's interesting. He gives details about the conclave that elected him pontiff. And I want to talk about this a little bit because he spins a good yarn in it. He doesn't... He, he, it looks like he's just kind of making things up because we have reports of what happened in that conclave from cardinals who leaked information. And Francis tells things in a completely contradictory way to that. What we know happened in that conclave was pretty simple. Bergoglio and Ratzinger... In 2005, we're facing off for becoming Pope. There was a force rallying around both of them, and Ratzinger won once the rule stipulated that it no longer took two-thirds majority, but only a simple majority to elect the Roman pontiff. That was 2005. In 2013, Ratzinger resigned, and people who knew Bergoglio, were, who had been in the room when he received that news, said you could see he had a lot of energy and was very happy to hear the news, as if he knew that he had a good chance at the conclave that was coming. Of course, he has said that he, you know, only packed a day bag thinking a conclave would be easy to take care of, that it would be a quick process, and that he'd be back to Argentina, and he had to clear his, his schedule and things when he found out that that wasn't actually going to happen. It would be prudent in that situation if you were a cardinal, even a front-running cardinal to become the next pope, to actually have your backup plans, your homilies for your cathedral masses, and your your you know every, all the other things in your itinerary prepared, on the likely chance that you weren't going to become pope, because most people who think they're going to become pope never do. So of course, but his memory of that, according to this book that was released contradicts everything we know about this process. And so I'm going to lead here with a kind of a different article. It's a, it'll challenge some people, I think, not in terms of their ability to pay attention, but because there's an accusation here. So from Info Vaticana, we get this headline. We don't know if Pope Francis believes everything Pope Francis says. If you're familiar with Peronism, the political ideology from Argentina named after Argentina's former you know, ruler, <laughs> Juan Perón, then you know that Perón was a, was one who if would shift from the left and the right as needed. He would feed his supporters on each side of the imaginary political aisle things that they needed to hear so he would have their support, and he played one side against the other. Peronism is an interesting political ideology, and it does really sum up Francis in a really great way, because as you saw with, say, that recent Vatican document that a lot of people don't see the problems in, the errors in that document were hidden behind things that Catholics with a well-formed conscience could easily get behind. And that's why so many people had a hard time seeing the errors in the document, because there were some very much needed statements from the Vatican in that document combating evils of our time. But they, were ma but they helped to mask some cha fundamental changes in Catholic theology that could have some profound consequences. So we don't know if Francis believes everything he says, because he often, as a Peronist, will say one thing and then do another. Amoris Laetitia is a great example of this. He kept saying for years, it will not be Holy Communion for the divorced and civilly remarried. And then he changed that with Amoris Laetitia. He said the same things about blessings for James Martin types. And then we got Fiducia Supplicants. And there's a whole list of these things. But he says one thing and often does another. Here's, from the, here's what the article has to say about that, though. Quote, According to what was published yesterday, the Pope unashamedly confesses that although the cardinals are sworn to secrecy about what happens in the conclave, the Pope has license to tell. In Roman parlance, this means 
the Pope can speak, but no one can rectify him or correct him. The Pope can tell a story and everyone has to believe it because the protagonists keep their mouths shut and tightly shut. Bergoglio says they tried to use me so that Ratzinger would be elected cardinal. The story is that a minority wanted to block Ratzinger's appointment by voting for Bergoglio and then put in another cardinal. The story does not end there. The Pope confesses that when I realized it in the afternoon, I told a Latin American cardinal, the Colombian Dario Castrillion, don't joke about my candidacy because right now I'm going to say that I'm not going to accept, eh? Leave me there meaning in Argentina. So we have to believe that Cardinal Dario Castrillion was in the operation of not electing Ratzinger when several members of this community of Lancers who have known and treated Cardinal Dario Castrillion very well. If there was a Cardinal who was a Ratzinger fan in the Vatican, it was Cardinal Castrillion, who can no longer see anything because he is no longer among us. End quote. So Francis is invoking a Cardinal who went to our Lord, <laughs> so can't exactly speak in his defense to correct the record. Funny how that works out. But the author concludes by telling us a story about how basically Francis's words are contradictory to the point where someone might feel inclined to seek psychological counseling because of how confusing it is. Right? I mean, it's hard to keep up with everything he says. You and A lot of people throw up their hands after a while and just stop paying attention to ecclesiastical happenings because Francis will say one thing and then say a contradictory thing like the next week on the same subject. And also, a lot of people throw their hands up in the air and say, it's causing me too much stress, I'm going to stop. I understand how that, that can happen. The simple thing here, is, though, is that in this story, Francis is either purposely not telling the truth, or he has a completely different memory of how the conclave went down than the actual official record. Let you choose which one that is. But be that as, as it may, his stories about that conclave are very, very interesting. Like, the, like this one from the National Catholic Reporter. Headline. Cardinals worried about liberation theology in 2013 conclave, Pope says. This story I actually believe completely from him. Because he's going to tell you a story here about how that conclave didn't go as quickly as it probably would have been because he had ties to liberation theology. That doesn't surprise anybody who's been paying attention to the last 11 years of life under Francis in the Catholic Church. But some cardinals have some worries about that. These would be the decision-making cardinals. These would be the kingmakers. These would be your moderates who would have done this, okay? Because they are the ones who will decide who becomes pope when things are deadlocked. And so if they have a hang-up about liberation theology, it's going to be them. These are not the progressives, and these are not going to be the ultra-conservatives who would not have taken Francis under any circumstances. Here's what he says here. Quote, A group of cardinals asked... Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio in-depth questions about liberation theology and its political consequences before deciding to elect him Pope in 2013, Pope Francis said. In the book-length interview, El Successor, The Successor, published in Spain April 3rd, the Pope said he, quote, did not realize that he was a serious candidate for the papacy in 2013, but that he began to put together the pieces of a campaign to elect him after a group of cardinals asked him about liberation theology. A theological approach developed in Latin America that preaches a preference option for the poor and seeks to free people from injustice and sin <laughs> end quote i can't i can't read that out loud without laughing it is so on its face absurd because that is the most liberation theology friendly definition of liberation theology you can possibly have and i'll get back to the article here in a second for you but liberation theology takes the ideas of Karl marx and tries to marry them to catholicism Okay, with the result being a revolutionary movement that radicalizes virtually everybody, including priests, and causes them to join actual fighting forces to seek to cause chaos in the rest so that they can establish a new hammer and sickle order of things in their countries. That's what it does. The church has condemned most of it, though the theology hasn't been formally put on an index of forbidden books because the church isn't in the business of doing that stuff anymore, unfortunately. If you want a great example of liberation theology that was up front in everybody's face... The Pacamama debacle and the Pan Amazon Synod. That thing was uh, practically a love fest for liberation theology. But the ideas themselves had been soundly rejected in the post conciliar era until Francis because it was too much even for the post conciliar church to embrace. But that having been said, the church did give a lot of like giveaways, theologically speaking, to liberation theology. You're familiar with the term the preferential option for the poor. That was never a term you'll, you would find in Catholic writing until the post-conciliar era 
as a response to liberation theology. That article here there was doing a lot of conflating between the two. But we'll get back to it because this is this touches on the conclave question here. So, quote in the interview, Francis told Spanish journalist Javier Martinez Brocal that a group of European cardinals badgered him with questions during a lunch between voting sessions May 13, 2013, only hours before he would walk out onto the balcony of St. Peter's Basilica and present himself to the world as the newly elected pope. They asked me things about Latin America, he said. They wanted me to talk to them about the political aspect of liberation theology, the supposed political deviation of that theology. As Archbishop of Buenos Aires, Cardinal Bergoglio embraced a preferential option for the poor, promoted by liberation theology, often tending to the Argentine capital's poorest neighborhoods and sending priests to work in those areas. But he criticized liberation theology's, quote, recourse to Marxist hermeneutics. His conversation with the cardinals appeared to calm their nerves, since Cardinal Bergoglio was elected pope that evening. Francis said that despite earning votes in the conclave's ballots that evening of March 12th and the morning of March 13th, I interpreted them as placeholder votes or votes cast by electors waiting to see who emerges as clear candidates before voting for their real choice. He recalled that several cardinals went to speak with Cardinal Angela Scolo, Scola of Milan, a candidate widely reported as a papal favorite by the media, and shared that he lear later learned that Cardinal Scola turned the, told them to, quote, vote for Bergoglio. The Pope also said that he had not written down the speech he made to other cardinals in pre-conclave meetings, in which he condemned the idea of a self-referential church, which traps Jesus inside and prevents evangelization, but rather that it came to him in a car ride conversation with another cardinal while heading to a meeting, end quote. So moderate cardinals were worried that he'd be a liberation theologian pope or some other form of a radical they then talked to him about it. He calmed their nerves about the whole thing uh, with his Marxist hermeneutic comment. And then they made him pope right after that with, a, with apparently the blessing of the cardinal who was his biggest competition to become the Roman pontiff. Cardinal Scola was actually a pretty big cheerleader for Francis early on until he retired a few years ago, though he did seem to break with Francis in the aftermath of Amoris Laetitia when the cardinal was basically retired from serving in any real governance capacity in the church. Cardinal Scola back in, I think it was 2018, was very upfront with saying that communion for the divorced and remarried was against everything the church had ever taught. So that was clearly a breaking point for him. Perhaps he had some buyer's remorse, given what is reported to have been said at that conclave. But here's why you maybe shouldn't buy any of this. We have an account from an unlikely source, actually, but someone who has some good connections, it appears, that... The reason Francis didn't become Pope in 2005 was because Cardinal Martini stepped in and said no. That's interesting. It's a very interesting take, given that Cardinal Martini is known to have essentially recruited Bergoglio to become his successor of things by 2005. Last Saturday in my live stream, I read this short letter to you from an Anglican prelate who converted to Catholicism. He has some interesting information about that process that few have mentioned. Here's what he had to say about the matter, though. Quote, In a recent interview, Pope Francis, I apologize, I don't remember who he gave it to, he gave it to El Successor, explains that it was he who had Cardinal Ratzinger pointed in the 2005 conclave. Exciting, and above all, it's not true. I was an involuntary and indirect witness to it. In 2005, a group of eminent cardinals wanted to support Bergoglio's appointment. It was the great Jesuit Cardinal Carlo Mar Maria Martini who dissuaded them and proposed Cardinal Ratzinger. The reasons in summary that were confided to me were that the former Archbishop Milan would have considered this appointment a disaster for the Jesuits. It even seems that he would have said something like, if he is elected Pope, we Jesuits will in fact be suppressed, as in 1773, this time not for 40 years, but at least for 200 years. Who became the current pontiff and what he had done in his previous functions in Argentina is well known with testimonies. It is difficult to prove and attest to who wanted him and why, but in the very days of his appointment to the papal throne, that is long before he began to govern the church, from many quarters it was explained what his task would be. 100% done. A book was even published by a French intellectual who joked about the consequences of that choice. Benedict had to resign so Francis could be pope. Francis had to be pope because Benedict would never be allowed... To, he would never have allowed the church to support the decisions made later to destroy Christian civilization, end quote. Now, we have heard, and I 
hinted at this earlier, that Cardinal Martini was the main reason Francis became Pope. That Cardinal Martini was supposed to be the original Pope Francis. And, but then he had health problems, and so that's why Bergoglio was, was recruited to this. It's been kind of a constant account of things from the recognize and resist side of things. But now we have an, a former Anglican prelate who became a Catholic who was close to some Catholic cardinals who were there, who say who says that no, Cardinal Martini apparently had some buyer's remorse and pulled back on it because he saw that Bergoglio would cause such devastation to the Jesuits that the Jesuit order would likely be suppressed after Bergoglio was gone. What do you think about that? Do you think that Francis is telling the truth here? Do you think there's elements of the truth in what Francis is saying? Do you find that that Cardinal Martini his, th that account from that Anglican priest, former Anglican priest, about that conclave is accurate. Very curious what you think about all this. This is interesting stuff because there's a lot of conclave talk going on lately, you may have noticed. Anyway, let me know what you think about this in the comments, please. If you like and subscribe if you haven't, it does help. So to sharing this on social media, that helps a lot too. There's also a, in the pinned comment below is a link to the fundraiser, the Give, Send, Go, that a viewer, watched, a viewer started for me after I broke some... In very incredible and great personal news on Easter, but it also complicated life greatly in ways that I, are unfathomable. So have a look, you know, and may God reward you for those. May God God reward those of you who cho cho choose to participate. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.